Very warm welcome to you from The Hague for this episode of Rabbani Talks, the interview program produced by the Lutfiya Rabbani Foundation. I'm Moin Rabbani, and I will be hosting the discussion this evening. The Lutfiya Rabbani Foundation is a non-profit foundation established in The Hague, the Netherlands, in 1979. Over the past 41 years, it has worked to promote Euro-Arab understanding and exchange through education, dialogue, and culture. You can learn more about the foundation and its programs at rabbanifoundation.org. The purpose of Rabbani Talks is to engage in discussion about issues relating to the Arab world, including culture, education, history, contemporary affairs, its achievements and challenges. You're encouraged to submit questions to our guests at any time during this program via the Q&A function on your Zoom screen. Our focus today is a fascinating exhibition currently showing at the Eye Film Museum in Amsterdam entitled Trembling Landscapes Between Reality and Fiction. To discuss this exhibition and the issues it raises, we are fortunate to have with us Nat Muller, who curated the exhibition, and Khuloud Al-Ajarma, a foundation scholar currently pursuing a doctorate in anthropology at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. First, a word about the I, that's spelled E-Y-E, -E, Film Museum, the foundation's partner for this installment of Rabbani Talks. Located in Amsterdam, the I Film Museum is the National Museum for Film and is also known as a cinematic memory of the Netherlands. In addition to managing an archive of more than 40,000 films, it organizes acquisitions, exhibitions, and debates about contemporary material. Trembling Landscapes, which we are discussing today, is being exhibited at the Eye Film Museum until January of next year. Nat Muller, who hails from the Netherlands, is an independent curator and writer based in Amsterdam and a specialist in contemporary art from the Middle East. She has published widely on this subject and taught about it at universities in both the Netherlands and the Middle East. She has curated numerous video and film screenings for projects and festivals around the world, from Helsinki to Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates. In the process, she's worked with many artists from both Europe and the Middle East, including Larissa Sansour, Nancy Atakan, and Walid Sitti. Nominated for numerous awards, she is in her spare time pursuing a doctorate on the subject of science fiction and contemporary art from the Middle East. Khuloud al-Ajarma was born in Aida refugee camp in Bethlehem to a family originally from the Palestinian village of Ajur. She developed an interest in photography and the visual arts at a young age. Between her university studies in Palestine, Norway, the United Kingdom, and currently the Netherlands, she worked with the al Center in Bethlehem to promote media production by refugee children and youth. Her photography projects have included Out of Focus, exhibited in monochrome, and From the Inside, Looking Out. As these titles suggest, both our guests have used their art to address prevailing misconceptions, stereotypes, and prejudices about not only the peoples of the Middle East, but also its geography. For those of you unfamiliar with Trembling Landscapes, we'd like to begin by presenting a short trailer about the exhibition. Nat Muller and Khuloud Al-Ajarma, a very warm welcome to both of you. We're grateful that you've made the time to join us. 
Uh, Nat, to start with you, we just watched the trailer to the Trembling Landscapes exhibition. I should add that its name is derived from one of the installments in the exhibit by the Lebanese artist Ali Sherry, about which more later. But first, could you tell us a bit about how you came upon the idea of this project, why you felt it was necessary to pursue it, and what you're seeking to achieve with it? Um, well, very uh, warm welcome to everyone watching us. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I was invited originally uh, by the I Film Museum with a quite broad question. They were interested in doing an exhibition with artists from the Arab world. And I got carte blanche. So um, that was very challenging because there's thousands of artists to choose from, thousands of works to choose from. So how do you start actually building a curatorial thematic? Um, but landscape uh, is interesting and specifically for a museum that deals with the moving image because um, the representation of Middle Eastern landscapes has been so determined by film and photography already for almost a century, um, especially in the West, we're used to those images of desert landscapes, uh, which, you know, offer um, almost like a terra nullius, uh, which is unchartered, evacuated from um, instances of modernity. Um, these are orientalized landscapes, ex exotic landscapes. And it's actually quite interesting how persistent that image actually still remains to this day. So um, that technology of image making and imaging of landscapes um, has an important role to play in how the Middle East is represented. And for me, it was important to um, not deny that there are not desert landscapes in the region, obviously there are, but to complicate that image and to also bring in that um, uh, these technologies of, of filming and depicting uh, landscapes from the region are really complex and, and also um, resonate with a, a longer history of colonialism, of resources, um, uh, you know, if we're talking about oil or if we're talking about water um, that are so important um, in terms of thematics in these landscapes, but also that these landscapes are uh, sources of identity, of belonging, especially within the Palestinian narratives, the Palestinian narrative, these are also lost landscapes. Um, these are emotional landscapes. So it's very rich in, in terms of what you can do with that. So I really wanted to show on the one hand that um, the work of these artists is still very much underrepresented in the Netherlands and deserves to be shown. Um, and their practices are varied and versatile and broad. But also uh, I wanted to offer an entry point to a very complex narrative, uh, art historical, but also geopolitical, and cultural. Thank you. Uh, Khaloud, you've also used art and particularly photography to address misconceptions about the Arab world. Now that you've um, seen, uh, albeit uh, virtually, trembling landscapes, did you experience it primarily as a collection of artwork or also as um, a piece of work with an underlying message or perhaps both? Thank you for having me, Moin. Um, I I did see it as um, as both. So one thing is the art aspect, and those who would see the the installations and the the different pieces that are exhibited would see different forms of art, uh, including like photography and also some film, some maps, and so on. So all these forms of bringing art together are very very important, obviously. But as, as an outsider seeing these images, they also moved things within me that are related to previous experiences, but also my memories of Palestine and the life in Palestine and Palestinian landscapes, obviously. And also the stories I heard from Iraqi refugees, for example, the stories I heard in Lebanon about the landscapes and about the refugee communities and so on. So I think what the this art exhibition does very well is to engage in these stories that people have in their back like in, in their uh, in their memories and their minds and then it really engages in the 
the current of the Middle East and what's happening in the Middle East, but also has some sort of a futuristic perspective of how these artists see the Middle East and see the countries where uh, their art is based. Thank you. Um, one thing that, that struck me is how much thematic material is, is packed into this uh, exhibition. History, conflict, migration, archaeology, geology, even science fiction. Um, and somehow it results in a coherent whole, which raises a question for Nat of how you went about choosing and then organizing the 11 contributions to this exhibition. Put differently, how does a curator go about her work? Oh God, that is the million euro question. Um, well, uh, I basically started um, with uh, making lists of artists and artworks that I felt uh, would fit. And obviously you end up with maybe 40 names. Uh, and then obviously you also have this physical space to contend with. And for anyone who has been at I, it's a very challenging space. It's not your regular white cube or black box, um, but it's quite complex. So um, there was a lot of back and forth in how many artworks can we get in there? How do the artworks speak to each other? Because I think this is a group exhibition. So it's also really important to consider that um, you don't only show, uh, let's say, um, a, a one specific uh, perspective, but that you get a plurality of voices and of practices in there. Um, and, and then there's also the working with the space and, and you know how that uh, works out. So. On the one hand, um, it is a process of, um, of editing, I would say, uh, and working with the physicality of the space. But any exhibition is also a story. So you want to make sure that you take uh, whoever comes to view the exhibition on a journey and that you tell a specific story. And, and I want to stress it's only a story. You know, I could have told many different stories. Um, but that kind of uh, narrative journey um, needs to be part of it. And um, there's also another aspect, because this is so much focused on the moving image, because that's what I does, you also want to have um, a versatility in how the image is exhibited. So not only single screen, but also split screen, multiple screen works shown on LCDs as well as works that are projected. So you try to create a dynamic as much as possible in the space. Okay. Um, turning now to the specific contributions to the exhibition, uh, Larissa Sansur's nation state forms part of the exhibition. Sansur is a Palestinian artist who uses science fiction to convey the experience of her people. In Nation State, sorry, the screen is in Nation State, Sansur offers a science fiction exploration that is both dystopic and comedic. Instead of dealing with checkpoints and roadblocks that fragment the Palestinian landscape, her solution is to show the Palestinian people as the inhabitants of a giant skyscraper. So if, for example, you want to go from Gaza City to Jerusalem, you just take the elevator from one territory to the other. Problem solved. Khuloud, uh, what did you make of Sansur's use of science fiction as a vehicle for narration, particularly for the Palestinian experience? In some respects, I found it more explanatory than reality. I, I found it fascinating and part, partially because of this use of science fiction, which I almost never use it in my work because it's more documentary style photography, for example. Um, and I think what science fiction does very well is that there is no limit to the imaginative aspect of it. So you can, as an artist, create something that is totally out of this world, but in a way, because it is fiction, it kind of works and it can relate to people and their experiences. So I remember when I saw the uh, the part about going from one city to the other through the elevator. I've part of me because I'm Palestinian and because I know how difficult it is to go from one city to the other was like, oh, it it, it is really interesting. Maybe uh, that solves a problem because, for example, I've never been to Gaza City because I'm from Bethlehem and I, and we can't physically go there. But then. In, in a way, it also kind of 
it's like a bunch in the face in a way for me because it's also shows how how um how in a way we, it is really fragmented the palestinian landscape that is really difficult to get from one place to the other and in a way as well the nation state that is being created in palestine now is very unfunctional so it also reflects on these ideas of palestinians wanting to build a state but where would that state be what would it look like what is the imaginative aspect behind it and in a way we still don't have that in palestine so the project really looks at these aspects of the palestinian future through art and i i find that really touching and uh, nat uh, do you have any comment uh, to add to that yeah, I think um, so Larissa has been doing this for almost a decade, working with science fiction uh, as a way to test out scenarios that would be very difficult to realize uh, in reality. And um, I think there's a few interesting things to mention about this specific work, because um, science fiction is very much a genre of world building. And though it's uh, this topic world building, what Larissa does, she does um, take the future in her own hands and crafts it. And this is not something necessarily um, that many Palestinians can do. You know, there's so many different forces, uh, international, you know, there's the occupation, it's very difficult. And she says, well, you know, even though this future is this topic, at least I am crafting this myself. And what I think is interesting with Larissa's work uh, as well is that it's very polished. So um, there's, sometimes an expectation that um, work that comes from the Middle East and specifically um, artists who are dealing with conflict, that in order for that work to convey authenticity, it has to be documentary. And Arissa rejects that. So she says, well, I'm not going to give you fiction. I'm going to go even a step up. I'm going to give you science fiction. I'm going to give you something that's so futuristic and speculative and otherworldly so that, you, that she also basically ba uh, breaks a paradigm of what is expected from artists from the region. And I find that very exciting how she does that. Um, but what I also think is interesting here, and um, those who um, are watching and who know nation estate um, will recognize it, but you also see this in this particular I image, is that in much of her work, Larissa also interrogates national iconography. So there's this whole questioning of what does a nation mean when actually we do have a flag, but we don't have a sovereign nation. Um, you know, we do have the Dome of the Rock, uh, the Al-Aqsa, but um, it's, it's a maquette, you know, it's not real because the, the end of the film, she actually looks over um, th through her window and you see the separation wall, you see the surveillance cameras. She's so close to Jerusalem, which is a reality for so many Palestinians, but she cannot access it. So um, what does all, all of these um, iconographies of, of, you know, um, of nation, of nat nationality mean when um, we can't, freely travel when we can't really, you know, function as, as Khulud said, as a, a proper nation. So she's questioning all these types of things in a very playful and very futuristic way. And I think it's a very powerful way how to deal with very complex thematics. Very powerful and also a very innovative way of, of addressing these issues. Um, in addition to its broad thematic range, the exhibit also utilizes a variety of audiovisual tools to explore the numerous dimensions of landscapes. These include, for example, static and moving images, the sewing of maps, and satellite imagery. Among these is Wa al Shauqi's Al Arab al Matfuna. Shauqi was born in the Egyptian city of Alexandria, but spent a good deal of his youth in Mecca in Saudi Arabia. His contribution to the exhibition explores issues of national identity, spirituality, and mythology. In Al Arab Al Matfuna, named after a village in Upper Egypt, child actors are dubbed in adult voices reciting scripts based on the fantastical stories of Muhammad Mustagab. I should add that it was, this was perhaps one of the more conventional devices used in uh, trembling landscapes. So my question for Nat is whether maintaining coherence with these wildly diverging audiovisual formats presented a challenge 
or whether this was perhaps a deliberate choice, and if so, for what purpose? It was very much a deliberate choice. Um, so, you know, that from one uh, room you go from polished science fiction into Wa'el's work that is um, also, I would say, you know, very polished, but very different, black and white. They speak in Fusha, so it's extremely formal. And then there's this complete estrangement because you have uh, these children who are dressed up as, as, as adults and, and, you know, they have those adult voices. Um, so, you know, it's, it's very a very estranging way of um, depicting a different story again. So for me, it was very important to, as I said in the beginning, to show a variety of practices. Um, because there's, again, a tendency to pigeonhole artists from the region in a specific category. And that's definitely something uh, I wanted to stay away from, but also to create a dynamic to the exhibition that, you know, you're seeing, for example, um, Janan al uh work, um, as we see here in the slide, which basically shows surveillance footage filmed over Jordan um, and this is still um, wild, but maybe we can um, show uh, Janelle and Annie's work. So she shows. I think we have that coming up uh, later. Sorry. Okay. For um, but she shows surveillance footage um, filmed over Jordan, um, aerial views, and you can go from that to an audiovisual experience as if you, you would have, for example, with. Um, uh, Rawan Abu Rahman and Bezel Abbas, which is very much a multi-channel, uh, heavy on sound, embodied kind of immersive installation uh, to Wael's exhibition. So I really wanted to create different kinds of energies, different kinds of, of working with the thematics so that um, also the viewer is challenged every time uh, in what they are experiencing and what they are seeing. So um, I hope it's in a way coherent, but I wouldn't mind if viewers come away with feeling that it's dissonant because um, I think dissonance is good, you know, and not understanding and, and actually wondering after seeing a show like this, what did I experience? Did I learn anything um, or, or what did I feel? I think that's good, you know? Um, so you, you do want to have those um, lapses of meaning in, in an exhibition as well. Sounds like you would prefer the, um, the visitor to leave with uh, questions as much as answers. Absolutely. Uh, Khulud, uh, would you like to add anything uh, to, uh, to, to Nat's uh, response? It is really interesting what Nat is saying, because that is my experience with seeing the different artworks, because I had so many questions as well. And I, I did think that there were links, and I think the links are between the experiences of the artists, what they wanted to, like the messages they wanted to tell about their, uh, their landscapes and their countries and so on. But it was also diverse enough to keep me as an, an observer really engaged in the different aspects and trying to draw parallels with my own background, but also the different works together. Thank you. Um, as mentioned earlier, the exhibit takes its name from Ali Sheri's contribution of the same name, Trembling Landscape. Sheri is a Lebanese artist who is interested in ruins, catastrophes, history, memory, and geology. In his work, Trembling Landscape, Six lithographs represent aerial maps of Beirut, Mecca, Damascus, Algiers, Erbil, and Tehran. These cities are known not only for political tensions, but also for being situated on geological fault lines and associated seismic activity. These natural fault lines are stamped with red coordinates. In so doing, Sherry shows that in addition to what we can see from above, there are also invisible forces at work below ground. This tension is played out in this work. The connection between geological and political time and its application across the region rather than to just one particular city struck me as particularly poignant. Nat, in putting together this exhibition, did you come across many other works that also try to represent unseen forces at work in the region? Could you, in this respect, perhaps also tell us a few words about a somewhat similar contribution by the Iraqi artist Jinan al-Ani, who I know you, you've just uh, referred to in the previous segment? 
Yeah, so um, Janan's work is very much um, about um, the development of uh, military aviation technology uh, and film technology. So basically the way how we see landscape change dramatically once we could fly, because then you could film from above. And that aerial view, of course, for military purposes, for colonial purposes, for purposes of control, uh, have been um, very significant in how um, we think of landscape. And um, if we can maybe show some of um, Shanann's slides, we can have a, a better idea because what she's doing in this um, two projections uh, is very interesting. In uh, Shadow Sights 1, she uh, flies across um, Jordan with a plane and there she wants to depict uh, this feeling of surveillance. So um, you get like very dreamy landscapes, this panoptic view of control, this idea of mastery from above. Um, while in Shadow Sight 2, she is trying to mimic uh, the aesthetics uh, and, and the visual experience of a drone that is locking on targets. So there you get um, an animation of photographs um, that starts large and then you know zooms in and zooms in. And of course, we are used to these images, particularly since the Gulf War in 1990, where you basically got the first televised war where they would mount um, cameras on missiles. Um, and I think it's interesting because the skies in the Middle East are not innocent anymore. You know, usually they are ominous. They are um, places where, you know, we have fighter jets, we have um, drones. Um, and I think it's interesting to um, look at that um, technology of um, aerial uh, mapping and cartography and, and see how much that translates um, into military uh, colonial depictions of those landscapes. But at the same time, Janan has ma made beautiful seductive images. So there's a real interesting tension there between the beauty and, and the seduction of the image and, and it's almost hypnotic uh, aesthetics, but still these are very threatening images and um, the technologies that are used to visualize those landscapes are predatory uh, and are um, also weaponized technologies. So it's interesting um, to always keep these um, things in the back of our minds when we look at these types of works. So a dichotomy between um, the image itself on the one hand and uh, the method through which it was produced uh, on the other. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, next, uh, we'd like to show a brief clip from uh, Khulud's short documentary, Fatima, which is based on nostalgic recollections of the destroyed Palestinian village of Ajur by her grandmother, who is, of course, uh, named Fatima and at the time of filming was a refugee in Bethlehem Saida camp. context of our discussion about landscapes and their representation, uh, how does this documentary and your visual art more generally seek to address misconceptions about the Middle East? 
Well, in general, there are so many stereotypes to start with about what the mass media portrays uh, about Palestine and Palestinians, about Palestinian women or Arab women in general, about religion and so on. So I, I try in my work to address these issues. And in the film itself, <coughs> sorry, in the film itself, I wanted to reflect on my grandmother's experience, who in a way experienced obviously what happened in 1948. She was uh, forced to leave her village with, with, the, with her children, but also she lived this life where she had to uh, really start from the very bottom to, to start in a refugee camp. Um, in terms of geography, it's very different from the village. She was a farmer, now she can't be anymore. And also all these years, 70 years of her life, outside of the village in her um, in her psyche the village is al always the point of reference so it's always in, in terms of what she eats she always would refer to what it was like in the village the life in the camp and in the film itself you can see like visually how different it is so the camp is very crowded it is there's almost no privacy um, whilst the village itself is an open space it's hectares of land that are open with literally only greenery and no no houses well the houses were destroyed and so on so there is that difference in the landscape that uh, these people who lived in the villages uh, had to experience because of their uh, because of their experience as refugees so the the camp is also very different and also the, the reality of everyday life. So for example, Ida camp is one of the most tear gassed places on earth. Whilst it is really contradictory with the fact that people one day lived in these villages where they had, uh, they grew what they, what they had to eat, they, they lived peacefully very much and so on. So it is, it's really about the ongoing memory that I wanted to, uh, to document in this doc documentary. And also, although, for example, my, my grandmother has no, uh, no like, formal education, uh, for example, she still managed to raise a family. She still managed to be very strong to tell the stories of 1948 until now. And she's very determined to raise her children and grandchildren on these beliefs. So th these are the ideas I wanted to share with the film. And also when in other projects that I worked on, there is this aspect that we also try to keep the young generation hopeful about the right of return to the places where they came from, but also the possibility of it. So when we tell these stories about the, the lost landscapes, it really helps revive the, the memories in the new generations as well. Uh, Nat, uh, any comment on that? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm struck um, th that Khouloud uh, speaks so much about memory, because obviously that's also a theme that runs um, very clearly through the exhibition as well. Um, I, I think anyway, the, the, the production of an artwork for, for many artists is anyway going to be a way to commemorate something in, in some way or other. Uh, but particularly, um, I think also if we look um, at the work of uh, Joanna Gituma and Khali Jorej, who show us um, a panorama of uh, uh, the city of Beirut, and this is a work of 2013. Um, and sadly, uh, that work has become a work of commemoration because after the explosion on the 4th of August, that part of the harbor that they're showing does not exist anymore. Um, and I think it, it's interesting to see, um, and, and Khouloud also touched on this, that so much of, of the work that's being produced in the region is very personal, autobiographical, individual memory, but it always transcends into a collective memory. And that's also true of the work of Hrayer Sarkissian, who shows um, uh, his uh, parents, uh, a maquette of his parents' um, uh, parental home that he destroys. Uh, so it's actually a destruction of the most unimaginable thought uh, that's possible. Um, so yeah, I, I think when we speak of landscapes- Sorry, this and, is and, in Syria. The, th uh, so this is Damascus, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, on, on the left screen, you see a replica of his parents' house and they still live there. 
Uh, on the right hand screen, you see uh, Hrayer wielding a sledgehammer and he's uh, destroying uh, this, um, his home basically. But um, I, I think, again, it drives home the point that that landscape is also emotional landscape. Mm -hmm. And it's also very important to uh, articulate that. Right. Um, uh, I should just uh, perhaps uh, take this op opportunity to, uh, to mention um, that uh, um, participants in today's uh, uh, webinar will receive uh, electronic version of uh, the virtual tour that will be uh, sent to them uh, by, by email link uh, in the coming days. But perhaps more importantly, um, how can one view this exhibition if, if the museum is closed? Uh, well, uh, the good news is we, we reopen today. Ah. So, um, and hopefully we'll remain open till the 3rd of uh, January. And um, yes, there'll be, there will be a virtual tour. Um, it's a 20 minute tour that I'm giving through the exhibition. And uh, on the I website, um, there's also other content. Um, we've had a public program and still have a public program. Some of that will be made uh, available through Pickle. Um, so for example, the work of um, Palestinian artist Jumana Mana, Syrian filmmaker Omar Amiralai, um, uh, Basmar Sharif and um, Ziad uh, Kuthum. Uh, they will be screened until the 3rd of January on Pickle. You can find all that information on the I website. Right. So even for people who can't make it to Amsterdam, they can still engage with the exhibition. And if you do, go to the museum, wear a mask and keep your distance. Definitely. Um, uh, a more general question uh, for, for both of you. Um, all, all the work we've been discussing today has been very much focused on the Middle East. If we imagine for a moment that you would have produced the same work about Europe, um, would, would you have in the end produced something similar? Uh, would, it, would there have been significant uh, differences? Are the underlying principles identical? Um, uh, how, how, would you, how would you see this uh, issue? Uh, perhaps uh, Nat, uh, to start with you. Super interesting question. Um, I, I think that the method would have been um, quite similar uh, in, in you know, the way that you actually um, try to see you know, which artists work in Europe uh, with landscape in challenging ways, you know, and what are the themes there. Um, and I can imagine that um, what I did not do in the exhibition, but I, I tried to somehow bring into um, discussion with the public program or themes around environmentalism and the Anthropocene. There are artists in the Middle East working on these topics. Um, Jumana Mana, for example, uh, in her work does that. Um, there's only so much you can do in, in a space, but um, it would have been a very different uh, type of exhibition, but I think in, in many ways, um, it would have also touched on issues of borders, uh, which definitely in the Middle East is a huge thing, but also in, in Europe um, that has, you know, ha has also closed its borders um, very much, you know, that's becoming, especially with um, the rise of right-wing populism and nationalism, you know, Brexit, these are definitely things that resonate. Um, so yes, uh, obviously, probably different themes um, with uh, intersections, but it's a very interesting question. And, and I think interesting intellectual exercise um, to, uh, to work on. Mm -hmm. And Khulud, then how would you respond to this intellectual exercise? Yeah, I, th I think also it, is, it would be challenging because my experience of Europe is different from my experience of the Middle East. So although there are, of course, borders and what governments think of borders, but it's much easier to travel, for example, through Europe, I would imagine that the historical aspects, aspects of identity also are part of that. So um, in Europe, I would imagine more um, themes related, for example, to racism, to migration, to um, these ideas of uh, outsider, insider perspective. Um, so yeah, I, th I think it is doable as, as an idea and very creatively, but
but the themes would be different based on the history and reality of the Middle East versus Europe. Um, speaking of, of history, um, both of you use, uh, let's call them modern technologies in terms of, of the um, audio visual methods uh, you use. Yet you're, you're essentially using uh, modern technologies to, in many respects, uh, represent the past. And I'm curious if, if, if this creates some kind of um, dissonance in the sense that your um, art is ultimately about representation, yet you're almost by definition um, uh, representing history through the lens of modernity, or at least of, of modern technology. Does, does that have much of an impact um, on, on the outcome of your work? Uh, either one? Well, um, if, if I, uh, maybe I'll start. Um, well, I don't think it's necessarily only about the past. Um, it's very much about the present and the future. I think if anything... Yeah, um, let me just interrupt you. Of, of course, you're right. But I, I guess to the extent that this art is a representation of the past, it, of course, also being representations of the present and future. Yeah, but I, I think, for example, the work of uh, Mohammed Hafida, where he... Um, obviously references the past and Sykes-Picot, uh, you know, where the Brits and the French chopped out, up the whole Middle East in, in British and French protectorates, and the 1917 Balfour Declaration in, in which um, the Brits pledged uh, a Jewish homeland um, in Palestine. Yes, that is the past, but they continue to resonate in the present. And he actually asks people now and how, how did these treaties, how did these international treaties, um, you know, colonial treaties, how up to this day do they continue to influence your um, experience of place? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think, uh, and, and, you know, obviously film is, is a technology that has been with us um, for a cent over a century. Um, I think uh, what film uh, and the moving image allows you to do is actually bring these different temporalities together. Uh, and that's quite beautiful so that you can see a lineage between um, what is the past and how we still experience in the, this in the present moment. But also if you look at Larissa's work, how that continues to propel us into a future. So I think that technology allows you to layer different timelines and, and see their connection uh, in, in a really interesting way. Thank you. Um, we, have a, um, uh, we have a question from Monica Lam addressed to both of you of whether you think um, that particularly during these uh, COVID times, whether you believe art can play an influential role and how we look at the world. Perhaps uh, Khulud, uh, we'll start with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Monica, for the question. Yes, I think art can play an influential role in any period of time, but now during COVID times, it is really a challenge to, um, to imagination in a way, because there is so much in many parts of the world, there is so much restriction now on issues that are related to creating art, including movement, including the ability to meet people, for example. Um, and if, if the work of art is based on these, on these issues, it becomes a challenge. Yet it is an opportunity for artists to look beyond these challenges into how are people managing their everyday life within the the COVID uh, pandemic. So there are so many creative ways that people are creating because they are in lockdown. And it very much reminds me because in Palestine, being restricted is not something new. Uh, so people over the years have created so many creative ways to keep in touch with each other, to talk across uh, rooftops, for example, and uh, or from window to window and so on. So there, I think there is a lot of artists in the Middle East and beyond.
done, but that are still doing work relating to uh, what they do normally, but in a more creative way, because these challenges are pushing them to be even more creative in their own way. And uh, Nat? Yeah, I can only concur. I think um, we're extremely fortunate in the Netherlands that uh, we have today reopened all museums and, and cultural um, platforms. And we're obviously living in a time where our worlds have significantly shrunk. You know, we can't travel, we can't do this, we can't do that. So I think um, art um, actually allows you to travel in that way, you know, to an imaginary, um, to have a different experience. So I can only plea with, with, ev with everyone who's watching is please go visit your local museums. Please go and support cultural um, uh, expressions because it is really important. And we've also seen that when we're locked up, we all yearn to read, to, to watch films, to go and see work because it's a diversion, but also because it enriches our lives uh, when we're so confined to our own spaces and to our homes. So um, yes, it, it is very much a, a pledge, um, but also a call to, for everyone to um, support art. It's very important, I think, specifically in these times. Um, which not only because of the pandemic, um, our worlds are shrink shrinking, but we also have to contend with, um, you know, a very dark political moment, I think, uh, nowadays. So um, we're absolutely in need of imaginaries um, to either show us different ways or um, to provide comfort. Um, and speaking of, uh, of viewing exhibitions, Nat, um, a question from uh, Hazem Saqf uh, al whether there are plans to um, uh, show the exhibition in other countries, whether elsewhere in Europe or in the Arab world. Uh, no plans as of yet. I would very much welcome it, but no plans as of yet. Yeah. And um, uh, on a related note, a question from Miriam Debates. Um, what were the challenges you faced, if any, um, to persuade the I Film Museum to conduct this uh, exhibition about the Middle East and whether you think there is a, a appetite in the Netherlands to better understand the region? Uh, well, I did not have to persuade them because they invited me as a guest curator. Uh, it was their wish mm -hmm. to um, do a project on artists from the Middle East. Uh, so there was no issue there whatsoever. Uh, what I do hope what will happen with this exhibition is that, um, you know, I has a very wide audience. And I hope that this is um, for a larger Dutch audience, an entry point to the practices of artists from the Arab world and that they become hungry to learn more about their work. And hopefully, more institutions will also show work from these artists. Um, this happens obviously in the Netherlands, but not nearly enough. So I hope that this is also a motivation for institutions that um, there is interest uh, within um, you know, the larger D Dutch audience to, to see this work and to learn more about the practices from artists coming from the region. And Khulud, in, in your uh, interactions, with people in the Netherlands, whether in uh, Groningen or elsewhere. Uh, do you also feel that there is a growing appetite for uh, knowledge about the region? Absolutely. And I think, for example, within uh, my students who are young um, Dutch and international um, people, they often show an interest in learning about the Middle East in general, but also learning about culture, learning about religion, learning and also challenging the stereotypical images that they grew up with. And obviously these are very dominant. So there are so many of these stereotypes that, uh, that still exist, even though today there is more access to social media, there is more access to the internet to look up things. But to, to be able to interact with things like artwork, for example, I think it doesn't only, uh, it's, it's not only a matter of pleasure, but also sparkles a lot of challenges that it, that it leaves the people with 
that it encouraged them to think, to, to research, to talk to others about it. And I think these aspects uh, bring better understanding of not only the Middle East, but of uh, the other in general. Um, now a question from uh, Todd uh, Reis um, in presenting a geography-based exhibition about uh, a distant region to a Dutch audience. There is a sense that there is perhaps some educational background or purpose to the exhibition. And how far would you go in, in saying that art can educate um, and whether you think art should have a responsibility uh, for educating, um, particularly when you're dealing with uh, an audience that has difficulty um, uh, finding uh, knowledge and information through other means. So Hi, Todd. <laughs> it's a very sneaky question, Todd. <laughs> so, um, and it's a really interesting question. So my personal position is that um, art is one of the few things that has the prerogative to do absolutely nothing. Uh, and I think that's wonderful about art. Um, I, I think there is an issue nowadays um, that uh, often you want to get funding for an art project and art has to do so many things. It has to educate, it has to have social impact, it has to, um, you know, so solve uh, political conflict. I think we ask too much from art and on the other hand, we ask too little from art. So is it just art for art's sake? No, absolutely not. I think art works on a different register. Um, I think art creates meaning um, on an emotional level, on a political level, on an educational level, but we cannot put art in the category that it has to do that and that it can have a social function or a political emancipatory function as for example, well, I don't know, um, political work does and political engagement does. It operates on a different level. And I think it's extremely important that we also allow it to operate on these various levels so that people can enter um, art and uh, in a museum or an exhibition um, with whatever background and luggage uh, and knowledge or no knowledge they bring with themselves. So um, I would hate um, if people uh, would consider this exhibition as a lesson in geopolitics, because that is not what I want to do with this show. I mean, if they understand more about geopolitics of the region, that's great. If they are um, encouraged to learn more about the Arab world, amazing. But in the end, it is a contemporary art show and it comes with all the ambiguities and frictions. And this is not um, an academic investigation. And we can obviously write PhDs about this exhibition, but I, I hope that this exhibition moves people, uh, makes them think uh, and actually provides knowledge in um, an informal way. So if, if that's the educational part of it, then that's amazing, but um, I mean, I myself am not a fan of exhibitions that want to teach an audience something, you know, I, I believe more in an organic and, and synergetic approach to how we experience uh, artwork. But this is not to say that it's arts for art's sake. I mean, that is anyway, I think an impossibility with artists from the Arab world who work in, in very difficult geopolitical conditions and their work will reflect that context. Khaloud, I saw you nodding in agreement on several occasions. And um, uh, that is, of course, I think the way um, uh, you would perhaps be inclined to have initially answered this question, very similar to what Nat, Nat did. But at the same time, there is also this tradition of art with a message or um, art that is produced in order to convey a message in which um, the artistic expression is almost um, a secondary vehicle for uh, conveying a message, whether a political or, or cultural or otherwise. How, how do you see, do you see a tension between these uh, aspects and do you think they can or should be resolved? 
I, I don't see it as as a tension, but I do see the aspects of that we are all part of our environment. And in a place like Palestine, there is always the like the responsibility, let's say, of the artist of like what message do you want the audience to go out with? And in a situation where um, th there is that aspect of like how do we get people to be more interested in Palestine and know more about Palestine and uh, face the, see the challenges that Palestinians uh, live with every day. So there is that aspect, but there is also like the, these psychological issues, let's say, that Palestinians also have to live through. And for many Palestinian artists that I know, there is that aspect of therapy in what they do when they do art, because they're, again, it's, they face many traumatic experiences li living in a country that is occupied. And I remember one of the projects that I worked with young people in Ida camp was called Our Dreams and Nightmares. And we, we had a group of young people to take photos to express what their hopes and fears for the future were. And when we started the project, we, we had workshops to brainstorm. And it, it struck me how much um, of these traumatic issue experiences these young people were talking about when they were talking about their nightmares. So there is that, let's say, healing aspect that art uh, brings in, but also the psychological state of the artist. And I think also it has to do with the, with the fact that in many, as Nat said, in, in, uh, in the Middle East, we are children of our geopolitical situation. So that is very important. And I think to be able to do the so-called art for art is a privilege. So, and, and not many have that privilege to be able to actually do art that is, let's say, isolated from the, the geopolitical situation that a person lives in. So, and I, I don't see many being privileged. And the other very important issue, I think, in Palestine, but also with my friend artists in the Middle East, is that for many people, art, like to use the Arabic expression, doesn't feed bread. So many people have to take art not as the, their primary job because it doesn't bring them like a reasonably good life because, well, at the end of the day, they have to work um, in a job that would give them a salary in order to survive and so on. So to be able to dedicate time and effort to art is also a challenge in that respect. And uh, Nat, you wanted to... Uh... Yeah, I, I just wanted to pick up on, on something that the Khulut said about um, art for art's sake, which is really a phrase I'm a bit allergic to. <laughs> but um, I think when art... I threw it out as a provocation. Yes, it's working. <laughs> But well, what I would say um, that for artists who work in, in very um, uh, pressurized environments, which you know obviously the Middle East is, to refuse to engage with um, you know political art, let's say, or social messaging, um, is also a, a political act. I mean, that act of refusal, I think it's also important to, to we can flip that, right? So uh, not to um, make art about the occupation in Palestine or about the civil war in Lebanon, but you know, to, to do something completely different, that too is a political position, you know? So I, I think um, we have to see that from different angles. Um, uh, and it's important, um, to, to accept the variety and diversity of artistic practice. I think one of the issues with art coming out of the Middle East or the Arab world is that there's such an expectation of what it should or should not do, which is a lot of pressure on artists. So um, I think um, no one should prescribe to artists what their practice should or should not be. That's up to the artists themselves. Well, with, with your insightful, uh, both of your insightful comments about the artist's uh, purpose and dilemma, um, we unfortunately now have to uh, round off our discussion. I'd like to thank both of you for this um, really fascinating exploration of um, a variety of topics about art um, uh, that we were able to address on the basis of the um, 
exhibition, Trembling Landscapes, uh, that uh, Nat Buller has curated. So both Nat and uh, Khuloud Al-Ajarma, thank you so much for taking the time to share your views and, uh, and insights with us. Um, I, I, my apologies to audience members whose questions we were not able to uh, pose to our two guests. And um, finally, on behalf of uh, Lutfi Rabbani Foundation and Rabbani Talks, I'd like to offer special thanks to Manara Leithi, uh, Marina Grama, and Marian Reinen for their help in um, uh, putting this program together. And I'd also like to particularly uh, mention Hazim Saqf al uh, Managing Director of Right to Left Media in Hilversum, uh, for providing uh, invaluable technical uh, support uh, for this uh, program. So thank you um, to my guests and to all the uh, audience members. And I'd just like to remind our audience that we will be um, providing a link to a uh, virtual tour of, uh, of the exhibition for those who are unable to uh, physically uh, visit uh, the iFilm Museum. Thank you and goodbye.